to everybody for coming. Um, it's an honor to have Ricky Ducournay here tonight. Uh, Ducournay complicates the image many of us have for the writer, insofar as she is at once a novelist, a short story writer, a poet, an illustrator, a printmaker, a painter, and also I've recently learned a potter. I think I think that's true. And in all the work of hers that I've come across, no matter the medium, Du Cornet shows a commitment to the unseen or the yet to be seen, drawing on dream, myth, and the erotic to reconfigure what is possible, formally, intellectually, as well as materially. Her visual art has been shown internationally, and she's been recognized for her achievements in writing with a Bard College of Arts and Letters Award, as well as a Landon Literary Fellowship and Award for Fiction. She's the author of nine novels, three collections of short fiction, two essay collections, five books of poetry, and she's provided illustrations for the work of Borges and Forrest Gander, amongst many others. Please join me in welcoming Ricky Ducournay. Lovely. I'm feeling really kind of crazy happy to be here for a number of reasons. For one thing, it's an extraordinary place. I mean, it's one of the places where things are really happening, really sparking. And I know it's a place full of really unusually um, interesting and uh, thoughtful people and inventive people. But also because I discovered CalArts in a special way. Years ago, um, I, was, I lived in France for a long time, which is why I discovered CalArts very late. And uh, when I returned, one of the things that happened is I, um, I learned to sail. And uh, I was living in, the, in Denver, and, and uh, my husband and I would charter a tiny sailboat in the Pacific Northwest. And we sailed together for two weeks. And uh, one year, we landed up at the Vancouver Film Festival. And uh, we went into the small movie theater. I'm not quite sure why. I guess uh, the film looked interesting. Somebody we never heard of. It was a small theater, unlike many of the theaters during that festival. So it was a very intimate experience. And this amazing film was shown. And it was unlike any film I'd ever seen. For one thing, it had enormous amount of tenderness and elegance. It was also ferocious, fearless, very muscled. It was very economical. It had been made for very little money. It broke all the rules. For example, it began with uh, old photographs. And you're not supposed to do that. At least at the time, it was unusual to have a film uh, where you would see still photographs. Um, it, it had a score that was basically incomprehensible. It was a very old, creaky, fractured record. And you could barely hear the words. And the words were, Daddy, oh, Daddy, please, don't go to the mine. And it was a film about the Anaconda copper mine. And that was a horrible place. And it had left, and it's still there, a, a great amount of toxins in a lake. And I had, living in Denver, I had read about something horrible which had happened. And I had read about this maybe five years before, that a number of snow geese flying over this mine, so Montana, view to Montana, in a storm had settled on this pond of toxic materials. And in the morning, they were all found dead, and their livers had exploded. And uh, at some point, I realized that one of the elements of this film had to do with those geese that were flying. And when I saw them at the beginning of the film fly, and then you'd see them again, so they were on their way to their death. They were on their way to Newton and Town. And I, I just, I thought this was one of the greatest films I'd ever seen, and an unforgettable film. And I desperately wanted to see it again. And I thought the filmmaker's name was Ken. <coughs> Wilkerson, and I could never find it. Um, it was called An Injury to One, and his name is Travis 
Wilkinson, and I found that today. Finally, because I, I thought this is ridiculous. Years and years and years are passing. I want to write about this film. Um, I have to find this guy. What I remembered about him was that, that he had gone to CalArts and that the film was his senior project. Um, anyway, I found him today because his name is Travis Wilkinson. After 45 minutes of, you know, just intrepid, bustling through, um, whatever it is online, where you look at Google, I guess it was, um, <laughs> I found him. And, um, and I wrote to him and I said, I'm very excited because now I've found you and I know you're still alive and making films and, and I can, where can I find that beautiful first film? And he wrote back and he told me where I could find it. And he's come out with, with another film since. But so that's how I learned about how art, because I thought, what's this? What's this place that produces such people that write a senior, that, that do a film for their senior project that, that is this extraordinary? So thank you. I'm really excited. It's been a great day. And um, I'm really happy to be with you. Um, I thought what I'd do is simply is, is read a poem, actually. For one thing, uh, it's not very long, but it, it also engages a lot of things that might be interesting to talk about. Um, and also because we're living such fraught, we really difficult, speaking of fractured times, and, um, and that toxic pool is just one toxic pool among many. And I think it's um, a very important time to be a creative artist and a very demanding time to be a human being. And I think what we're doing is absolutely essential. And, um, and I'd love to be able to talk with you about that. And I would love to listen to you uh, talk about this moment and um, your engagement or disengagement or managing of it, um, whatever it is you're doing, and, and engage in a conversation. So if that sounds good, I'll read my 10 minute poem. Um, I don't usually talk about the work that I do ahead of time, but um, this poem, White Pestle, pounced and pounced after so many things that happened. Um, for one thing, Orlando, and um, the mother, the murder of Philando Castile. Um, also what was happening in the streets, what is continuing to happen in the streets. I mean, all of these things that haunt all of us and keep us all awake at night coalesced and, and it seemed that it wanted to turn out in this particular way, and so it did. So White Ketzel. We came together in celebration. Is not every world a miracle? And like the twins joined at the hip, so were we tethered, sparking the night in a place named House of Birds. Not long after, and seen for the first time, the four moons of Jupiter circling like sharks. We came disguised as a vulture. We offered him, I'm sorry, he came disguised as a vulture. We offered him the guana, flowers, our most beautiful boys circling the sky, suspended from their weeping chests like moons. In the light of the torches, their bodies black with soot, the boys, moon boys, lizard boys, sacred as jaguars, tethered at the heart. In the year named death, names split down the middle. The boy who called herself White Hetzel, the boy who called herself Lady Cormorant, the boys, egret ruler, doorkeeper, he the first to fall, all at once seized in a sea of sprung traps who cried out like deer, Moon woman has fallen, true magician has fallen, mother, I too have fallen, here I am, hanging, come for me, come for me. In the year named lament, in the year named all of our losses, viscera unspooling black and red on this day named 49 death. When gravity overcomes us, when our magic fails, there is no place a body can hide. We wondered then, where are our mothers? 
in extremity shouted out, where are our mothers? We made ourselves invisible. The jaguar does this, the moon, the snake. We lay still, a big black blanket holding up the stars, a voice shining in the wreckage of the air. It's okay, I'm here with you. Much later, some of us returned to a certain kind of visibility, the floor bleeding the moment, spilling its dark substance into the days to come. Some awaited in the place named White Bone House with broken jaws forcibly initiated into a dark knowledge. It is said that in extremity, everything eclipses everything above and below is born of shadow and formed of light, light which has no body, yet dances. It was then, there at the side of the road, my friend caught my eyes, held them. They leapt, moths between the hands, his bloodied cord uncoiling between us. Later, I walked away unseeing without him. Now I walk each hour of the days alone and unseeing. Such work cuts the tongue from the mouth. Yet before it happened, we were all the colors of the rain. We were the music of Jupiter's moons in motion in the infinite reaches of deepest space, our bodies tethered at the heart, suspended in something as sacred as water. Know that each encounter, each embrace, leans over the edge of a crater. If we fall, we fall all the way to the other side where the pavement pools beneath the force of the multitudes running from danger. Know that pain resides in a street scattered with CDs and cigarettes. A child supper spilled on the landing, a spine, a snake broken against a wall, a woman standing tall beside the highway, her pride shining before she is made to die, fear striping her back. Now even the rain smells bad. That very night, in that moment of the sweetest of afternoons, over there across the street on the lawn, suspended from that tree, that fence there, do you see it? It's okay, I'm here with you. Everything scorched, the scales of snakes, the fur of jaguars, their eyes, the bones of their feet, the soft, purposeful organs, their beauty, oh, the beauty of the children. It happens fast, a world reduced to gravel, to vapor, a stench that does not belong to us and yet is ours. See there, the heart swinging from its rope. As when in an airport, a subway, a city street, a jail cell on the prison stairs in custody, it begins on a sidewalk beside a city park. And then a boy and all things within his vicinity vaporized. It was like that when the tongue was cut from the throat of the world. We hid like roaches behind the toilets, but couldn't make ourselves small enough. In this way, betrayed, as is a child, hiding behind the curtains beneath the bed, deep in the closet, the cellar, the train car, her mother's overcoat hanging from a hook. Standing there, thin as a pin, small as a mote of air, cloaked in the very body that when struck repeatedly breaks. As this transpired, I was with her concealed in that place about the city you know so well. The sound of the night owl, the moving water and breezes, all this making us as safe as within a house of paper. In the distance, we could hear the music, smell the corn roasting, the iguana meat crisping on the coals, hear our people singing, their voices made for stories, their clothes made of feathers, and at their ankles, bells. In this way, they were the children of the gods, their hearts secured in a box of green stone. I sat with my mother, our heads together holding hands in that place where once there were people known for the extremity of their innocence who spoke all the languages of the flowers. Recalling this, perhaps, my mother held me close, said, little creature, little sprout. The air shimmered in the heart of the coming summer as beneath us the world collapsed. We saw it happen. In that instant grew old together. The heart of the people crushed beneath a weight so stubborn no one has been able to lift it. Not to this day. We have exhausted ourselves trying. See my mother, my mother on her knees, changing color, melting like wax. She is ablaze. She says, he was killed like a cow. And it is true. 
Born of men, he was killed without mystery. She says, he didn't do nothing. He didn't have a cow's face. He had the face of a man. That was my man's face. And this is why I'm here now in this hard place in the city. I need someone to come for me. They say, when you are buried with bullets in the body, and when the flesh falls away, those bullets fall. See, they tumble before coming to rest beside the bones. And that makes no sense, not that nothing's making sense of things that matter. Oh, my beloved, my boy, my only love, your body changes color, your chameleon body, pristine as a step of stars, your perfect knees, the palms of your hands, run through by metal, by anger, the holes in your back. I wish I hadn't seen it. I wish none of this had transpired, not here, take it elsewhere, send it careening into deep space. Why don't you, for we are burdened, joint at the hip in the hard work of dying. Falling together down the steep side of things as we are fallen, propelled by a sail the size of a lunar sea in a ship no bigger than the eye of an ocelot, the bunghole of a fox, its nose a nipple, probing the ether, leaving behind it a trail of milk. My mother said, please don't tell me he's gone. Don't let him be gone. His body a star assaulted by a shadow. Still, we heard him shouting, Fa, bell, dill, ball, bull, dal, del, dill, doll, do, do not, he said, do not do it. Please, don't do it. She said, my body is mine. See, I mean, it is sacred somehow. Keep a respectful distance. She said, I am not an animal. He ignored her, and after the fact, galloped away in the shape of a horse, the color of lead. He had the face of a goat, white as cheese. According to the authority, she closed her eyes. The knife was left lying with its sharp edge up, she hanging by a rope of hair. The following day, we named Tribute, the day that follows macaw madness. Tribute takes place in the heart of hell, right beneath the angry eye of noon. Now they are speaking over him, saying, take a handful of white salt, toss it across your shoulder, on to the backs of the cattle. Take a little hair between the ears of the cow, a little blood, a teaspoon of gunpowder. Piss shit and you will forget forthwith where and when the unthinkable happened. Now, in this instant, strangers bestow their grace upon him. They say that once the Pleiades signified a flock of cockatoos. The horns of cows were worn as amulets. These suspended above the door and a window above the bed where the little ones were conceived later to be born with the faces of children. We are not cattle to be corralled into a pen brought down with a thud. Know that when night comes, it is not because the sun has abandoned us, only it has been eclipsed by a thing for which there is no proper word nor a tongue with which to speak it. This word arrives like a truck, white as all the angels. That's it. That's white pencil. And... <laughs> Tough times. Um, so what should we do? I would love to talk and, as I said, also listen. I've got other stuff I can read, but if you're in the mood for a conversation, as I am, I'm up for it and really, and really eager. I mean, I think if there's ever a time to talk, this is certainly the time, because it's such a tough time for so many reasons. Everything is fracturing around us. And I know it's a hard time. It's a hard time to find one's center. Um, it's a hard time to manage to sit still, um, not have one's thoughts <coughs> disrupted by the morning news. Um, and maybe a bad dream. Um, it's a hard time for our friends. You know, it's, it's a difficult time. I think it's hard to be human, even in the best of times. Um, but so much now is at risk, and there's so much to be done, and such a deep revisioning to be done, and a deep rethinking of everything by our very curiously wired species that keeps harming itself. So, what do you think? You up for engaging this? Yes. 
What do you think the role of mythology is in this contemporary moment? I think it's important. I think mythology is always important. And, um, and of course, we're up against a very curious set of mythologies right now. Um, those of you that read The Deep Sea you know that I'm really interested in, in the notion of magical thinking, you know, the magical thinking which is the positive kind that, um, that inspires the poetic imagination. Um, but then there's the magical thinking that is all about false news and, uh, and a magical thinking of the world that is really deeply destructive, you know, unexamined uh, racism, for example. Um, so, I think mythology is a place that is, um, you know, has, has an enormous amount of potential always. I mean, that we question our currentness, but also there's a wealth of, um, of myth mythology that is fascinating and enriching, deeply human, and belongs to our human culture. So, for example, this poem was very much interested in, um, in the, the ancient stories of the Maya and the Aztec and what, what happened, actually. I mean, when I was writing about Orlando, I was thinking about what Cortez did in, in uh, Mexico City, what happened to the, the, um, the Aztec people. I don't know if you know the story, but he invited, he invited the nobles, the poets, the philosophers, the teachers, the dancers, the musicians, the performers. He invited everybody to a feast, and then he killed them. They were surrounded, and they were all killed. Um, so, so as a writer, I mean, I, I, you know, that's an extraordinary moment in time, and and it's a an eternal moment in time, and it's a moment that keeps on happening. And so the the there's a, there is a kind of mythical circular time there, you know. That's, I mean, I'm thinking of oh gosh, Sunstone, that wonderful um, what's his name? So they checking out on. Ah, a great Mexican poet and writer and essayist who read Sunstone. I think that's read Sunstone. That is one of the greatest poems ever. I'm um, sorry? No, um, Paz, Octavio Paz. Write that down. Yeah, it's a gorgeous epic poem. And, and, uh, and he does something, you know, to answer your question, mythology, so the mythologies of Mexico inform that poem profoundly. He's also writing in uh, mythical time, which is circular time. And he's talking about yeah, the, the destruction of the Mexican people, the near destruction of the Mexican people, and Cortez. But meanwhile, there's this constant rebirth that takes place within the poem. So every time things can break apart, fall apart, shut down, it opens up again. Um, there's a moment when schoolgirls just suddenly run out into this public uh, place in full sunlight, and the poem takes off again, the life takes off again, and then it shuts down and it opens up again. And then it's all haunted and formed by you know, the, the greatness of Mexico. I think it's really important. I was once um, talking to students at the American Indian School of the Arts in Santa Fe, and, um, and one of the things that seemed important to me to, to discuss with them there was the importance of, of uh, a very, very rich cultural tradition that's important and interesting in so many ways and enlivening and deepening in so many ways, but also a tradition that really engaged profoundly uh, the natural world. And, um, and uh, one, of, one of the students who became a poet, a really interesting poet, asked, if, he said, was the first question I got, he came to my office and he said, do I have to write Navajo? And I said, no, you're a writer. You can write whatever you please. And he said, good, because my tribe, you know, my family, my school is coming down to write Navajo. And I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be caught in a museum. You know, which, which I thought was really interesting. And we talked about how culture is a living thing. And, um, but then, <coughs> when engaging with the whole group of people there, what came to the conversation was, yeah, but you, you are informed by a really rich mytho mythological tradition. And that, you're so lucky. Because that is immensely engaging. So for me, I mean, I'm really interested in people like uh, Roberto Colasso. I don't know if you guys know him, but one of the greatest storytellers of all time. It's C-A-L-A-S-S-O. Um, 
For example, he has a book called The Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony, and he begins with the earliest Greek myth, and then uh, the book proceeds to offer a family tree of Greek mythology, and it's a big, gorgeous book. And um, and as you read it, you see the myths growing. You see the gods growing in their, in their numbers and in their muscle. And he did the same thing with Hindu mythology, and the book is called Ka. And it begins with the oldest um, Hindu stories. And he's a wonderful retailer of story. And he does these great asides, at least, to give you context. Um, and then he, he takes us all the way through up to the beginnings of Buddhism. And Ka, Ka is the, the eminence sort of uh, energy behind all the gods. And Ka means who? <laughs> you know Colossal. Yeah. Yeah, and so there's someone behind you. Yeah. What do you think? Good stuff? Are you asking me or him? I'm asking you. I've, I've heard this a tiny bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you look very knowing. <laughs> <laughs> I've read that as another tremendously important book for the writer, I think, Uses of Literature, that and Six Memos for the Next Millennium. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like if you read Six Memos, you don't have to need to look at any other books on writing. It's, just, it's, it's so good. The Uses of Literature, at one point he says that, and I might, maybe I mentioned that actually somewhere in the Deep Sioux, that literature sees beyond the, or writes beyond the language of politics. You know, art sort of sees beyond the the very reductive language of politics. So on the one hand, there's politics as we're seeing it now, which is a reduction of every, you know, politics into this horrible, gnarled, smelly, you know, yeah. Um, what, what, how can I describe it? I mean, it's, what's happening is this, this really evil reduction, toxic, um, misunderstanding what politics really can be, which I think really is moral vision. And, um, I think the problem for the writer is that one needs to reveal the, the issues at stake. One needs to reveal what, for example, abuse of authority looks like, rather than wagging your finger. When you're writing an essay, you're writing perhaps more, um, I wouldn't want to say didactically, because I think it's always a mistake to be didactic, but I mean, you also want to reveal it. But you're, you're naming, you know, you're sort of naming the names. Whereas in a poem, I mean, what, what I, think, I think you want to do in the process, in some ways it's so different because it is always about revelation. And, and, you know, as soon as you start sort of biting the finger, everything falls apart. That's true with an essay as well, but it's um, still, it's, there's a kind of, there's a, a, a real clarity as to where, you know, where you're coming from because you're naming you know, like I've got a little essay 9-11, about 9-11 in there, and, um, and talking about prison system and naming numbers and all of that. That's, it's, a, it's a somewhat different process. I like the idea of a poem as a vehicle for, for all of this. Um, and I like the idea of returning to the past, I guess. I mean, it wasn't really a choice, it just happened in part because even if you, you don't recognize exactly where it's coming from, you have a, you have a sense that there's history behind you know, this, these ongoing mass murders. You know, this is one form or another, it keeps, it keeps happening. And I, you know, and, I, and I feel, I mean, ending, so I ended with Nice with the white truck, 
But that white truck showed up then in Spain not very long ago. Just like those geese that I began talking about that show up in this wonderful film at some point. I looked online today, I was trying to remember what year that happened, and I discovered it happened, it happened this year again and last year. Except that 19, in 2016, there were 10,000 geese passing over this thing, so thousands of geese died. Whereas the initial kill-off that I had read about and then saw in this wonderful film, that was closer to 400, I think. Does that help at all? I mean, it's such a tricky, you know, and, 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 and then I don't think there's any rule. I think so much of that is intuitive. I mean, you just, you lean into it and you want, you know, you're hoping that reader <laughs> will be leaning with you and that it'll it'll just keep up in you. Yeah. Would you mind defining what you mean by didactic? Because I know that term is used to shut down certain kinds of writing. It's it would be called didactic. Yeah. So could you could you So I, I mean I that? see it as finger wagging, I see it as telling this is the way it is and this is the way it should be and this is what you should be thinking. And and, and um, you know, I mean it's preaching. See it as you know that uh, I, I have all the answers. Let me tell you, <laughs> and here it is, you know, we should write that down. <laughs> Whereas, um, yeah, I don't want to do that, and I don't want people to do that, or writers to do that to me either. I want, I want to, you know, I want the revelation. I want that moment of, oh. I mean, so for example, in this film, what he does, um, we, we, we're learning about the anaconda mind, and we're learning that the people in charge of that mind are not only producing extraordinary toxins, which they never get rid of, obviously. It's still killing animals, you know, and people, I'm sure, in Butte, Montana. Um, but, um, now I just lost my train of thought on releases. <laughs> it's, okay, it's um, also revealing the horror in this beautiful way. So he begins, early on in the film, one of the things he does is you see the geese moving. And then, and then other things happen. And then they return. And at some point, watching the film, I suddenly had this chill. And I remembered this thing that I read in the, in the Denver Post, whatever that was, eight years earlier, five years earlier. And I thought, oh, shit, I know where he's going with that. Oh my God, that's where he's coming with that. Oh, and that's exactly where he was going. But it was brilliant because um, you, you, know, you, you didn't even have to read the thing the Denver Post to begin to realize something very ominous was going to be happening. Just as he gave us some numbers, didn't know what those numbers were, as, um, as the film progressed and you realized that this extraordinary person who is uh, a Native American um, union guy who was coming to speak to the 12,000 people who were really enslaved by this company, telling them that they were getting sick and they were underpaid and they were in hell and they could do something about it. And you suddenly realize, my God, those numbers, that's a copy. And so it's, it's beautifully done because then you receive it, you know, in this profound way. And he's not saying, you know, this is, or that, that even this is bad. You're seeing how broad the reaches and how really evil this company was, but he's never telling us that. He's letting us figure it out, you know. Yeah, yeah, and that's so much more powerful. Yeah. Well, these seasons of recursion uh, happen more in my creative practice where I'll kind of begin to start re-unpacking um, past works and it's like I had already experienced that thing and it's happening again through the process of revision. So I'm just making sense of, well, as I go forward, will these kind of leaps and memories, I'll see something else and be like, oh, that brings me back to this other time. Seasons of recursion. So um, when you revise, are you, let's think about revision is sort of tricky and fascinating to me. So I always feel like, personally, I'm not revising so much as really getting to the writing. And it sounds like that's what you're doing, that, that you return to it and it extends and it sparks, right? And it gets exciting. 
You know, I mean, like you're upping your antes constantly. So it seems to me the first, the first draft um, is um, is often full of received ideas. It's not always, but it, it, is, it is often stuff we've heard before or done before, and that's why it comes so easily. Um, and then you get it back into it, and then the writing, I think, really begins, you know, this could be deeper, it could be sharper, it could be hotter, it could be sexier, it could be funnier, it could be more frightening, it could be, I say looking at Brian. How much darker? How can I make it darker? <laughs> then you do. <laughs> yeah, so I always think, of, yeah, that's, that's the exciting part, really, the writing. So I, I think always think of revision, I may be completely wrong. It's in my own mind, it's more like an editing process or something. Um, not particularly interesting, <coughs> but the writing, yeah. Um, and I, and I, I feel like, yeah, that, that connection with memory that you're talking about too is so tremendously important because there is so much energy there. Um, and the deep suit, of course, is all about that, you know, knowing your, the powers that animate your imagination. I don't know, does that help at all? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm going over something I wrote like two years ago, and it's it's this it's the third draft that I'm doing, but it's, it's, like getting, it's getting sharper, and more clear. Mm -hmm. It's like a kind of a focusing, and it doesn't feel finished. But I wonder if that sense of not finished would be even true on the fourth or fifth draft. That image can get me high that. Well, that's such an interesting problem too, and I think it's really personal. I mean, I, think, I know writers who feel it's never finished. You know, just at some point they feel, well, <laughs> yeah, this is this is what it's going to be. Um, and others feel like, yeah, it's actually finished. I couldn't go back and change a thing. You know, uh, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean one is better than the other whatsoever. I mean, that that idea of something sort of always open to possibility is a really interesting one. Um, so that's fine with me. I think that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. There's no one way. I mean, that's one of the, I think, the concerns that I've had about workshops, and I, I bet that is not a problem here, but often it is a problem that people have are told really what, what they're supposed to be doing and what they should be looking like, and, that, you know, the, um, and, the, and, and, and terribly reductive things like I want to see what this person's wearing and I want to know what they've had for lunch and I want to know, you know what their name is and you know, that's you know and I want you to think about who's who's the editor you want to be you know reading this who's your audience you know, who's your public and all all get all of that out of the way because it's it is not you know it's not helpful. No. Okay. You read Bright Fellow. You mentioned uh, unexamined racism. Bright Fellow is more about, in a very abstract sense, unexamined classism, mm -hmm. especially in academia. Mm -hmm. um, and so the political problems, the, that question, the overarching question you posed, they're, I suppose, theoretically resolved. Um, there's a pool in the population that would be facing capacity to work things out, but there is um, a distinct lack of humanity in academia, I suppose. There is, there's a very dynamic nature, so there are steps for someone to climb. There's a closed door and a vicious person behind the closed door, but the public image of that person is someone who's well informed and kind, progressive, liberal, educated, um, all these. Ideas that come with titles and positions and prestige and where you come from and the institution. So, okay, my question is ultimately uh, like, since classism is a, like a, a construct, uh, how important it is, it is to deconstruct that first. Like, racism is really abstract. Uh, classism is definitely not as abstract, it's a highly structured. <coughs> Academia can go about changing. I think one person is expected to write Navajo and Jurassic, which is like, no, that's not necessarily true. The expectation for someone of a certain 
wrap it to write a certain way or a certain way how um, any structures and more structures can play their role in deconstructing unless they have perpetuated or participated or existed in. Is there a question there? happening now is that enormous man is being questioned. Now, while you're right about Reinfeldt, that's part of it too. Um, but I, 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 I thought the emphasis, yeah, I mean, it was clear also I was deconstructing those guys because I mean, they're such fools, you know. Um, um, but I, I mean, I think racism is as much a problem and as much a real, you know, vivid um, problem as classism. And, and of course, they also go hand in hand. Um, but you know, I think I think that there are also exceptions in academic life um, because there there are also so many people who really truly are interested in not only in ideas but but letting those ideas out so that the classroom becomes a place of great investigation and subversion and liberty, and that's what we all want from our colleges and our universities that we really learn how to think. In other words, we're really learning to be autonomous individuals and thinking for ourselves and breaking all those walls down. And I do think that there are people who are doing that. But you're right, there also is a structure in place. And, and in some ways, um, maybe some of the sort of fustiness of, of the past is has been taken over by corporate fustiness, you know, or cor corporate muscle of another kind. And, um, and it's maybe just as scary, if not scarier. Um, because the demands there too are, are re so reductive. I mean, in any case, these things are terribly reductive. Um, and, and also the idea that one is honored yeah, for their title and their position, and that's always worrisome. And, and I think the, the teachers that we admire are the ones we really love and really can engage with um, see through that too. But, but um, right now, I mean, we're seeing, and, and it's, it's brutal, as well as solitary, a real questioning of all of that. No. But I was just surprised that, that nobody, none of the reviewers or readers that I know about really noticed that kind of sappy racism, you know, that kind of um, unexamined, you know, dopey, everyday fantasy life that, that, these, that these characters have. And that's, that's really surprised me, especially now. You know. And I think there's a lot of that going on. You know. Has that answered at all? Yes. Yes. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> about this with such clarity and, you know, and, and, um, and he says the books we write are informed by the moral ethical beings we are and I think that's true and, um, and I'm sorry we'll, we'll talk after but I, um, I, I think I um, was very aware of that at the beginning that uh, that I had to trust my intuitions and I had to you know I had to trust that I would I would manage this material in a, in a thoughtful and ethical way, and um, and that was that was a big learning experience because I, I, my second novel is about a French Nazi and written in his voice. Half of it's written in his voice, and and I had a lot of questions about that, and and I wondered 
Um, I'm, do we need another, you know, Nazi's voice? <laughs> you know, and I wondered about the fact that he was he was a kind of grotesque and, and ridiculous often, and therefore funny. And I wondered about that. And then I just, but but this was how this book was happening, and and I I felt I needed to trust that energy to see where it would go and and kind of intuitively manage it. And I and I realized I was learning a kind of moral muscle that I didn't even know was there. You know, how do, how do I balance this material? And some of it was just, you know, do I feel queasy or not? You know? Um, but I but it was great. It was a great learning experience. And the funny thing about that book is that it, it had a history that engaged that problem. For example, it came out um, it came out in England first, and uh, and then here with uh, City Lights. And um, the agent, my agent, took it to France, and the agent there sent it to a bunch of the major presses. And it was a period in France when France had not yet really, really confronted its Nazi past, and it hadn't really confronted. Um, the Algerian War had really confronted so much that was deeply wrong with the culture, or understood it. And, the re and, and because there had not really been enough of a conversation about it, and because the Nazi begins the book, they thought it was an anti-Semitic book, they thought it was a, they, didn't, you know, they couldn't read it, they just threw it across the room. And they told this publisher they never wanted to work with her again. And of course, she didn't take the book. So that was the first reaction to that book in France. And then um, it got picked up again, so weird, by a small press, and got one great review, but then it was basically ignored. But then 10 years later, it got picked up. And, and over those 10 years, these questions had come forth. And these, the horrible generals in Algeria who had been pushing torture, um, books had been written about them. And, and France's Nazi past had been looked at closely. And, Suddenly there was room for my book, and it got these major reviews in Le Monde and all the observatory, all these places, and they loved it. It was extraordinary. So it was a new generation of readers. But the first, you know, the first response to it was just absolute rage. And there, there's that too, you know, that you, you never, you know, what the life of the book is is going to be, and how, and then there's always a risk that it'll be the wrong moment for it. Yeah. I think, no, I can deal with the marvelous red hair. Oh, no. Oh, 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 oh okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I think the idea that happiness, we're for, you know, our, our moral, our moral vision will surface and trust that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the deep two, you speak a lot about the magic of language and sort of its relationship with all these spiritual and like kind of the core of society and communication. And, but also there's this really violent potential with language. And, because um, it, you know, it's a tool that can be used for a multiplicity of, of purposes and ways. And so like earlier when you talked about the, you know, there's mythology and then there's fake news. And I'm just wondering, as something that I feel like I've been struggling with is like even wanting to engage in it at all, with it at all, because I never really know, you know, it's like, how do you know that you are not just perpetuating further violence? Because I, I doubt, you know, people that, I feel like, I don't know, a lot of people that use language think that they are doing the best right thing, even if they're not. And it's such a powerful medium that can just be so manipulative and wreak so much havoc. I, I don't know. I, my question is sort of loose, but I'm just wondering. Because it seems like you come to it really with a reverence. And I'm wondering if you, how you weigh I think, that. Yeah, part of the reverence is, you know, I, I really believe in responsibility. I mean, I, 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 do, I do think words matter and meanings matter. And I do think that there is an enormous difference between free speech and hate speech. And I think one of the big 
problems right now is there's a confusion in our country, this vast confusion, you know, that, that I, you know, I have the right to speak. Except I think to have the right to speak or the right to write involves responsibility. There's no freedom, there's no democracy without responsibility. And hate speech is a big problem. And there's a difference also, I think, between hate speech and, um, and the idea that um, you, you can, you're only limited to the certain things that you can write about. And that, that's an, an immense issue right now. And it's been around for a very long time, and it's gotten really virulent. And I think it's a tremendously important thing to talk about, because your question really is addressing that, too. You know, the idea that, that, it, um, that it is wrong or irresponsible, invasive, all of these things, to write in a voice that's not one's own. But, but the thing is, I mean, as, as um, this really interesting student at the uh, School of Native American Arts, what is it called, Santa Fe American School, Native American School of the Arts, um, I mean, the, the, concern, the concern is being told, as probably many of us in our families, you know, you know, you cannot write about Uncle Max. You know, who do you think you are? Don't dare write about this and that. You know, that, I mean, this is old stuff. Or we're in a capitalist society that says, oh, we're not going to publish that book because the oil companies that support us are going to really be angry at us. I mean, there's, there, there's so much that gets in the way. I mean, it's no accident that the first thing a fascist dictatorship such as Pinochet's in Chile does is to cut off the hands of a, of a singer and tell him to pick up his guitar and sing. You know. I mean, the, the, the writers and artists are among those who, and intellectuals who light up in prison first. Um, so I, I feel that, that we need to, as creative writers, yes, really venerate the words and use them really carefully. And part of the process of becoming a writer means that you're in a process of learning how to be a thinker and a rigorous one, because it's right there on the page. And if you mess up stylistically, and if you mess up ethically, morally, it's going to be right in your face. And that is wonderful. I mean, I think, I mean, I feel personally I became a much more thoughtful and politically aware person when I became a writer, because I was taking on really difficult things. It's impossible to know. I mean, I think it's unlikely that um, a, a psychotic murderer is, is going to run with your book that it has some violent scenes in it, it's not impossible. I mean, that is a bit of a problem because um, that's just the nature of the world. I mean, it's you know, you, you know, you send the things out into the world and they can be abused, they can be misused. You know, I mean, though I've been involved with surrealism for a long time in, a, in a, 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 both a deeply engaged but peripheral way um, because there are aspects to that um, very alive and very interesting um, aesthetic movement and political movement that, um, that I find didactic. And so I've always been involved in, and yet also on the edge. But I think of how surrealism has been so profoundly misused. And, and initially by advertising, Salvador Dali, who was at some point booted out by Andre Breton because his politics were so shoddy, um, you know, was, was one of the great masters of. Uh, of advertising, you know, he really used it to do his own benefit. I mean, there's no way of covering all your bases, actually. I mean, there's, you know, you, I think you write a book as, as wonderful, as inventive, as, as responsible as you can, and then it's out in the world, and, and you will find your readers. I mean, if you've done, if you've produced something real, you know, if you've produced something thoughtful, it's, it, it's going to find its readers, and maybe a lot of them, or maybe a small group of really passionate ones, and, and you never really know. And you may, and some zany, you know, person could pick it, pick it up and think, I mean, I wrote about the Marquis de Sade, you know, and I, I have no idea if there are any mad men and women out there who have been inspired to do evil with that book, but I kind of doubt it. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it really saw it, maybe. I don't know about my book. I don't know, Brian, what do you think? Is that, does that worry you? You know, it's, I think it's a complicated question. It's just you try to be responsible. I think that's the thing. 
And, uh, but it is true, a book has a life of its own when it goes out into the world, and you really can't control it. And so you, you just try to be as responsible with it as, as you can when you're kind of putting it together, and then you let it live its own life. It's like having a child where, you know, your child ultimately goes off and does what they want to do. So. Yeah. Um, I know Calvino is really important to you, and I feel like uh, he does an incredible job of sort of, I, yeah, teaching, I guess now sounds didactic, but sort of teaching or guiding or uh, allowing the reader to learn how to read the book like giving them a vocabulary for how the book wants to be read or like how to engage with the book um, in this way that I admire and I wonder if you had thoughts about if, um, if that is some aspect of writing that you are responsible for, for teaching your audience how to read what it is that you're writing through the writing of it or if that is. That's okay. How do you see that? Can you think of an example of that? Um, I like, the, like just the way the way Invisible Cities like uses text or like is placed on the page or the way uh -huh. that like uh, the way that it's cadenced and like you have a lot of space between things. Yeah. So you're like, which I guess is a very sort of formal way or like like in Fawn and which side of travel it just sort of like makes the reader a character and so then you can sort of like that you know like I don't know I just think that's something that I felt that he does very well and this is very specific but more generally yeah if that's so interesting because I've I never thought of that but I realize that that's what punctuation is all about for me or or breaks when I'm writing fiction um and then poetry I'm very aware of the poetry making lines how how I want it to be read. But I, yeah, it's really fascinating. I've never really thought about that. You know, I was aware that I was thinking about it in a particular way, but clearly. Well, and I just, I, it, it feels like didactic or somehow controlling to decide that you're going to tell people how to read something. No, but it's I like so. It's your work. You have every right in the world to want to, you know, punctuate it or place it on the page in such a way that they're going to read it in a particular way because it's intended, you know, to sound a certain way. There are pauses. Yeah. You know, one of the things I write about in the Deep Sioux is the the ancient um, Arabic calligraphic tradition where there were these little diamonds above the calligraphic text, the sacred text that was sung, and when you and they, they were sparks, in fact, so a moment to pause. But when you would pause to take a breath, they would catch fire and ignite the text. And um, that's such a gorgeous example of what you're saying, really. You know, because it, it, it even goes beyond just the sound, you know, the singing with its pauses. But you're also igniting the text. Wow. Um, and that, and I, I love that because I thought, yes, that's what I want to do all the time. You know, I want it to always be quickening, always catching fire. I, you know, I think. I think we've all been made to feel so guilty about what we do for so many reasons. And I think capitalist culture really wants us to feel guilty because we're not out there in the business <coughs> world screwing people, you know, and taking their copper <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, or we're just a playabouts, you know, apparently, and we daydream, you know, and we use up a lot of paper and, um, and, and writing subversively, you know, talking about pleasure, and we seem to be attached to the natural world in this unusual way, you know, and we're interested in sexuality and eroticism, not particularly in pornography, or if we're interested in pornography, it may take forms that are somehow incomprehensible to the greater pornographic culture. You know, there's, you know, there's all of that, I, I think, and, you know, and I'm at, and, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm writing about a, a country and, and, and in a voice, you know, the voice of a person I am not, now, I mean, I, mean, I had this colleague at the University of Denver who said, at the height of the, the, the previous height of this madness, really, um, that that Flaubert had no right to write Madame Bovary because he was not a woman. But but the thing is, we're wired. Our species is wired. You know, just as birds are wired to sing. You know, we are wired to tell stories. Apparently, a lot of mammals are actually. Um, and um, and it's a beautiful thing, and I think it is a sacred thing, and and I think we have to stop putting all these questions, you know, and limits on it. 
I mean, if a book is, is irresponsibly written, if it's a lousy book, you can throw it across the room, right? You know, but, but we have to stop. I mean, our culture and our families have been for too often, too long, wagging their fingers, saying what we can and cannot write about. I think we should, you know, should be allowed to write it all. I mean, for most of the writers that I've worked with in workshop, it is a problem to close a door and explain to, you know, one's husband or, or lover or mother that they're not being shut out. You just need to have a quiet space in solitude to do this work. You know, I mean, it starts there, for God's sakes. So give yourself a break. <laughs> You know, I mean, this is a place, it's demanding, and it's gorgeous, and it's exciting, and it's some of the deepest living that we can do, and we are wired to do it, and we've always told stories, and we've always, uh, just as we said, we've always sung. I know there was this wonderful moment, remember, in Paris, at this um, And Now conference, and, um, and there was, there was this, and, you know, maybe this will sound unfair, but there was th this group of writers who felt that, who had a very clear notion of what experimental literature should look like. And the last day, Harry Matthews gave, gave a reading, an extraordinary reading. So he was, the, at the time, the only American member of Olipo. Do you guys know what Olipo is? Yeah. And you know, he gave this fabulous reading, and, and when he finished, um, one of the people in the audience, who I felt being very didactic about what experiment meant, asked Harry if, what, what is that called, the, the, the uh, so restraint? Constraint. Constraint. So he said, if the constraint gets in the way of the creative imagination, do you, do you continue because it is, it's a constraint you, cho you chose at the beginning, or do you drop it? Then he got really angry, and he said, this is not a church. Of course I drop it. It, the whole point is that it, it, it pushes the imagination further in a, in a more interesting place. Of course I drop it. Um, and then Bob Coover, you know, the sort of grand pope of all of this, he was in the audience, and Bob said something like, he stood up and he said, Harry, it's, it's, it's the ineffable, isn't it? It's, it's, it's like singing, isn't it, Harry? It's, it's, it's like... It's like the inevitable, it's like the inevitable song, isn't it? It's, isn't it? And Harry was, yes, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so there's that, too. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a breath of life, for God's sakes. You know, it's eros. And it's, and the worst thing you can do, as you know, to a child is tell them to shut up, you know, and because I said so, and not listen, and all of that, you know. And, I mean, to take the breath away, to take the voice away, to take the language away. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I remember having an argument with my agent once, you know, and she said, what are you doing, you know? Who is this reader you're writing for? Um, you know, so how dare you? You know, you cannot call your book that because nobody wants to read about Inquisitions, you know? There's this battle that we would, we would have. It wasn't just my battle with her, it's a battle going on all over the place all the time. And right now it's really ferocious, and it's and it's very, um, you know, it's, it's this kind of moral outrage, you know, like some grand hierophant telling us what we can and cannot do. We can do anything. There should be no taboos. The thing is to do it well, to do it thoughtfully, to do it responsibly, to do it beautifully, and that's you know that's already a big that's a big job. But to to be shut down for one writer to shut down another. I mean, there's so much to be angry at. There's so many enemies of the creative imagination out there. There's so many <coughs> enemies of, of, of the erotic. I mean, look what we're doing to our planet, for God's sakes. Um, you know, the, the, the tragedy is immense. You know, but what we can do as, as, as people who, with creative imaginations is, you know, to stoke those fires and keep them burning and, and, um, and, and, and give the space, the, you know, the loving, compassionate, marvelous space to those around us. I mean, we're a tribe, a beleaguered tribe, and if, you know, if we start hating one another because there's some rule that is supposed to be broken, you know, then what, how do we get out, Ember? You know, the morass we're in. 
mean, I really count on artists being part of getting us out of this. You know, I think, and I think, you know, writing well, writing beautifully, writing for all the artists who've had their hands cut off, you know, all the people who've been shut down, you know, that's a good way of living in the world. I think it's a very responsible way of living in the world. Plus, it's what we do. I mean, this is the way we live. This is the way we think. This is the way we respond to the world around us. Now, this is the way we understand it. Many, many voices. And, um, and books can, can inspire people to think. I mean, I know for me, growing up, reading, reading um, 1984, for God's sakes, you know, reading Alice in Wonderland as a little, little kid, you know, I understood everything about the use of authority and the ridiculousness of, you know, pomposity. And, you know. Those are subversive books. Yeah. And I, and I, when I think about, you know, the Calvino quote about the books you write are from God is moral and the things we are, in this chain, in this, com in this dialogue, there's also the reader. Mm -hmm. and, and subversion to a person who resists the idea appears didactic. And I guess that's what I'm trying to, uh -huh. to get at. Uh -huh. Like, if we're assuming that it's a monodirectional sort of thing, I feel like I can say with a great deal of confidence, mm -hmm. well, I should not tell people what to do. But it doesn't happen in a vacuum, does it? If we are actually speaking against a condition that needs to be spoken to, we speak to it in that way because we know their ears are not there to hear. So I guess I would, I, and I go, it goes back to my earlier question. There is... Are there things that, you know, you say, you know all right, we don't do this, we should not do these things. And is that automatically considered didactic? In the, in I think it just, yeah, it depends, I think, how it's thought to propose. I mean, yeah. like Tanya Hesse Coates' wonderful right. book, Between the World and Me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, that's a, that's a book that is constantly about revelation. Okay. And I mean, I think that that's one of the things that's so wonderful about it. You know, that, I mean, he wants to, to give his reader a sense of a body in a street, what that is like to be moving in that body in this country. And I think he does it so brilliantly. And the fact that it's a book that's written for his son also moved me very, very deeply, you know, because everything is actually about the sons and daughters. I mean, ultimately, if we're going to change the world, it begins with family, you know, duh. I mean, and, um, and God knows we're harming our children every day, profoundly. So, yeah, I mean, I think he's a great example of how you do that well. You know, because he never wags his finger. That's what's so great about a guy, you know. He's a tremendous writer in that way. Thank you for the Yeah. No, thank you for continuing with that, because it's really, it's a tremendously important, important question, yeah. And I don't know if I'm still, you know, all that fully clear myself, really. But I do notice that I, I, I mean, I will scold myself when I'm writing, when that will pop up, you know, I just hope I always catch it. But self-righteousness, I guess that's part, you know, it's, it's worse. We're seeing a lot of that, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What else? Yeah, way back there. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of influence from like the Pacific Northwest in your writing and in some of the images we looked at in class. So I'm wondering uh, if you want to speak to the influence of like location when you're working. That's interesting. In which book? Uh, in the Deep Zoo and um, what the piece about the artist's workshop that you went to it seemed really. Um, I lived in Tacoma for a while, so it kind of reminded so me of that. Workshop. Which one was that? I think it's Adobe. Uh, I think it's the, the image that's on the cover. Oh, the the, the yeah. painting on the, the the photograph on the cover. Yes. Because I actually I I moved out there relatively recently, and so the things that connect to the Pacific Northwest. Um, they're the three essays I did in local artists in Kansan, 
And I, what I was doing, I was publishing these little books on local artists, because I, I, I thought that would be fun to do, and I, I thought their work was wonderful. It started with a friend who was possibly dying of breast cancer, who I adored, and her work is so wonderful. Unfortunately, she survived. She's doing really well. Linda Okazaki, I thought her work was extraordinary, and she was, she was ill, and we, we started talking about projects, you know, and, and then it turned into this book. And, um, and then I loved what happened. I mean, she had a wonderful show, and, and, um, and those books were available, so then I did another for another friend whose work I love, and so I, I ended up doing four of them, and three of them were done when I was putting the Deep Sea together, so the one real connection to the Pacific Northwest are those three essays, um, Margie McDonald and um, Anne Hirodell and uh, Lindo Kizaki, who are local Port Townsend artists. But, but that's really interesting what you're saying because, because I think what, what sometimes happens when you're reading is that our own landscape informs the reading. Because in fact, as much as I adore this landscape, and have moved there for a reason. Um, it is, I think it is still on the periphery of, of my writing. No. I showed them some art as well, a lot, some of which have been um, Oh, the art, uh huh. Visual art. Yeah. Oh, because of this sort of sea biological things. This is easy. Yeah, yeah that, that's probably where it is, come to think of it. And the, um, yeah, I can see that for the art. Like recently, I did a show, and I've been—I worked for about a year and a half on these scrolls that are—they're um, 24 feet long, and I did 10 of them. And um, and I was thinking of the flots and the jetsam that I see on the on the beaches that a scroll with with images that would sort of unspool and pick up all kinds of different things. So yes. <laughs> One more question, oh, yeah. two more. Yeah. Um, uh, my, my understanding might be incorrect, but uh, we, I mentioned when we were discussing uh, the Deep Zoo that it invoked in me a very similar feeling that I got from going to the uh, Museum of Jurassic Technology uh, in Boulder City, and I yeah. was told that you might have had some inspiration from that. And I was curious if you make a conscious effort to uh, evoke the kind of, uh, I don't know if the emotional tenor, the kind of feel of the space in writing, and how you might go about doing that, if you do. I think there, that the affinity is that, um, not that I was inspired by that fabulous place, um, though I did once propose a project to them that they just felt it was too artistic and not sort of faux scientific enough. <laughs> it's more archaeological or anthropological. Um, but I love that place. But I love it because I've always loved um, museums and museums of natural history and museums of science. And, um, and I, I love their, the, the way they run with that and run actually with the idea of um, a, a kind of false path because science often takes a false path but proposes those imagined uh, sciences as real. And apparently the one, the one installation in there that, and it's so strange, that is really based on something real is one with the ant. Do you see that? There's a, it's sort of a lot, it's sort of like this, and there's um, an ant, I think, at the bottom of the top. And um, so what is this ant? Eat something, what does it eat? It's been too long. But they eat something that, makes it go crazy, and it goes to the top of the tree. Do you know what that is? Yes, it's a, it's a parasite. It's, it's a parasite, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it gets get a parasite, and then that... That attract, it causes the ant to climb to the top of the yeah. grass, and there's like a flag almost that sits That's right. The birds, <laughs> that it's, that it's a spore, it's a spore. It looks like a bottle of spore. <laughs> That is one of the great places in the universe, that little museum. There was somebody else. Oh, there. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, this, this is kind of similar to the political agenda question, but I was wondering to, to what extent the critical uh, 
influences your creative process. So um, when you start a story, is there a certain uh, prompt usually, uh, or um, a certain idea or concept that you've been interested in that you want to explore, um, you know, through fiction, or do you usually start um, intuitively or from some emotional space? I start intuitively, and and um, usually it, a voice pounces, you know, and and um, so it's like a character appears. And, and says, here I am. <laughs> I want a story, or I want a novel. <laughs> um, and sometimes a uh, thing can be moving along, and, and a minor character says, this is my book. And, um, and I have to pay attention. And then I've had a number of books that, especially early on, that were precipitated by dreams. So one of the ones that I've, I've mentioned before, because it was so, it, it was so vital, was hearing, waking up hearing in my head, a fan is like the thighs of a woman, it opens and closes. And that just sent me running downstairs, grabbing my pen and writing. And within the first, you know, just writing 25 minutes or so, I realized, oh my gosh, this is a fan maker. And she's speaking, and this is her voice. And then I got this wonderful Encyclopedia Britannica from 1922 or something. Um, I don't know, 70 volumes. I got a big thing. And I got it because I could find things like this. And I ran downstairs, and sure enough, fan making was there, available. So I read some stuff, and then I ran back upstairs and uh, continued writing. And then realized, oh my god, she knows the Marquis de Sade, and they're friends, oh dear, I'm going to have to read all of the Marquis de Sade. But it all started with, um, he's a character I'm going to have to deal with him now for the next two years. Um, but it, it, it's, that's the way it started, but it was though, it, it is so a floodgate had been open. And I've had dreams, I mean, I became a novelist because of a dream that was so powerful, it threw me out of bed. And when I began writing novels, um, the short stories, too, which have come mostly that way, sometimes with, with dreams, with novels. Um, I was even counting, I became a very lucid dreamer because I wonder, you know, how, I, how do I do with this French Nazi, you know, powers, whoever you are, you know, give me, give me a dream, please, you know. And, I, and it was great because I would, I would have these dreams that would be, once I figured them out, it was, oh, that's brilliant, okay, I can do that, you know, thank you, powers. Very mysterious process. I, mean, I really don't understand at all. So yeah, but essay is another thing. I mean, like right now, thinking of this wonderful, um, this wonderful film, um, an injury to one. That would be a really interesting film to write about in relationship with Dawson City, Frozen Time, which just came out, and and an extraordinary Italian film that was called From the Pole of the Equator. She also movies about movies and using old photographs and old film. So that's different. I mean, that's an essay. I, okay, that's what I'm going to do with that. But um, there's no one way to do it. That's what's so great. I mean, you can have a perfectly fabulous idea and move from there. I just don't. You know, I have this funny, and I think that's maybe why I have this deeply intuitive sympathy with surrealism, and always have because it. Because I depend so much on dream and intuition. You know, getting into this kind of zone, you know, what is that all about? I mean, it's, it's, it's a sea of story, you know, it's like waiting to grab us. Let's give Ricky a big hand. Thank you.